content wise, what are the pieces of content that screw SEO, don't think about it for a minute, that you just want to have for leads, for prospects, for people to visit your website. And oftentimes that's the content that can actually either do well for SEO now or later. And if it does, even if it doesn't do well for SEO now, that's okay because it's serving other purposes. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the SaaS SEO. So I'm your host, George Kassiotis, and today I'm very happy to be joined by Nigel Stevens. Nigel was previously head of SEO at BigCommerce, which I assume that you all know, and now leads organic growth marketing for the last four years. Organic growth marketing is a partner for companies like Hojar, Seabob, Unsplash, Segment, Intercom, and the list goes on. And they help those companies scale non-paid customer acquisition via SEO and con. Nigel, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks, to have, thanks for having me, George. So I think that uh, I, I, I first, you know, my first touch uh, with, with you and the first time that I saw you speak about uh, all these interesting things about con SEO was a TechBound podcast with Kevin Indig. And after showing that, after I saw this episode, I remember that I told myself that we've got to bring this guy to the, to the show. Uh, but before we get into the, uh, the questions that I have for you today, I would like to uh, know a few things about you uh, and your background and what has brought you to where you are today. For sure. Well, it all starts with when I was four, I knew I wanted to get into SEO and no, I'm joking. Uh, you know, like a lot of people sort of stumbled into SEO accidentally got like a weird copywriting job, which turned into a weird SEO job, which turned into another weird SEO job. And then I got to big commerce. And that's where I sort of got to apply all of these very sort of raw, like SEO foundations in an enterprise environment where, you know, you can't just do a bunch of weird stuff where it's a real brand that's worth like, you know, hundreds of millions or a billion plus dollars and is serving high-end customers. So when you take sort of like the basic SEO strategy I have learned and then sort of morph it into enterprise, I sort of started building my own understanding of how to do B2B SaaS SEO. And then from there I left in a sort of, you know, quarter third life crisis, something like that. And it's like, oh, maybe I'll do a bit of freelancing. And then I started getting a lot of great referrals and started working with great companies and sort of took my rough playbook at big commerce and began to refine it and refine it and build a small team so that we could, you know, scale all of the little things that go into SEO and then still maintain a high level of focus on the big things. And then fast forward, I guess about, what is it? Four years and here we are now. Okay. That's, that sounds great. And uh, we will talk about these things that, that you do uh, specifically mm -hmm. with, uh, with organic growth marketing, but can you give us a bit, of an overview of uh, what the company uh, does and uh, what types of clients do you usually serve and who gets the most value out of, of you know, a partnership with you? For sure, yeah, I think the last part of that question is important, like who gets the most value out of it? Because I talk to some people and I say, hey, like, I think your company is cool and you're doing interesting things, but based on where you're at now, like it wouldn't make sense for you to make the investment in us. Like there's a way you could do this more efficiently to maybe try it out or some way. But, I think the, the greatest value is derived from B2B companies who are very brand driven and they want to understand what is the scale of, uh, of like a thriving SEO program? What can the ROI be and what are all the things that go into that? And then lastly, I would say like brand driven companies that don't want to sell their soul. So a lot of the time it's sort of implicit, but they say, Hey, we know that we could do a bunch of weird stuff, but how do we put forth content that doesn't embarrass us? that actually gets people to convert that like our brand is proud of and does it in a way that, yeah, like makes us feel good about it. Thanks for explaining. And speaking of adding value and uh, how agencies can help specifically SaaS companies, B2B SaaS companies um, uh, grow and achieve great things. I would like to ask you, I would, I would like to start with a, with a difficult question. What, in your opinion, is the added value of bringing an agency into a high growth SaaS company and how you, as you know, the person, the partner uh, who's going to help that SaaS company, how do you communicate that to your clients nowadays? Especially if we consider the fact that 
we all know that unfortunately there, there is a negative bias towards agencies and in many cases rightly so and uh, that companies can hire great talent in-house. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Got it. Yeah. So like a good marketer, I'm going to start by reframing your question. So I think a lot of the time SEO doesn't work and it's actually not because of the agency or the person in house. Now I would completely agree with you that agencies have a terrible reputation for the fact we were just chatting before the show that I wouldn't even use that term to describe what we do just because it has so many negative connotations. And to me, agency means that, you hire really inexperienced people really cheaply and a sales staff and you arbitrage the cheap labor and you actually end up giving people work that isn't very expert driven. But the reason why I think SEO doesn't work a lot of the time is because people aren't thinking about it like a channel where you put in X and you get out Y. And for example, a company, they might, a lot of the time companies I've worked in and I've worked around their expectation of SEO is okay. Here's all these things you're doing now, sprinkle some SEO dust on it and help us SEO this work for us. So what you have to do is say, no, 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 that's not how it works. Here it is. And again, a lot of the time there's, there's this false expectation on SEO when people hire in house and that prevents in-house people from actually being effective. And then it's even more so for agencies because if you're hiring in like sort of any vendor is sort of trained to tell people what they want to hear to be able to sign their name on a contract, right? So to say, hey, we need you to do this deliverable and this deliverable. It's absolutely, we can do that deliverable and that deliverable. Even though there's a fundamental misconception of the channel from the very beginning, and they're basically already set up for, for failure because then later they go, oh, well, we want to do all this content. We want to do all these landing pages. It's going to need this design. And they go, oh, no, no, no. Here's the resources. Here's the deliverables. Just do that. So I think agencies have a bad reputation, number one, because a lot of them aren't set up to do process as well at scale. And number two, because they're more likely to sign up for situations that don't have good results. And to be clear, like I'm not knocking anyone. I think there's definitely people out there that do really good work, but there's also a lot that don't and we know that. So we have to be realistic. Um, and then as far as working with agencies or whatever you want to call them, I think the, when it works well, the reason it works is because number one, like we have like a, a, on my team, we have systems and processes that are pretty repeatable. Now we don't do the same thing for every company whatsoever, but for example, the way we do research, the way we make content recommendations, the way when, when we're dealing with sort of an interesting situation, shall we call it internally, we don't get flustered because we've seen it a bunch of times and we know what people's objections are to uh, like how to implement something or how to think about it and we know how to get around it. And then the other thing is that we've worked with, we work with, we've worked with a bunch of companies over time and simultaneously with a decent amount. So we're able to see as trends evolve, what does it look like for different companies? And as someone who's been in house, some people who work in house, uh, they do, a, they do freelancing and they talk to other people. So they have a good wide sort of understanding of things, but it's also, it's very defensible, but it's easy to get stuck in a one website frame of mind and not be aware of how things are evolving with other sites. That's a great answer. Now, I know that you work with a lot of uh, B2B SaaS companies, many of them are very well known and popular. And I can only assume that some of them may be a bit in earlier stages. And my question here would be, how should those SaaS companies in earlier stages think about Condesio if they should think about it uh, at all? Yeah, so maybe this answer is a little unpopular, but in a binary sense, my answer would be, don't worry about it, don't think about it. Now there's a whole bunch of nuance there, but it, it's a pretty simple concept really, because the, the earlier you are, the harder it is to get results. One unit of effort early on produces like, I don't know, half, a third, a 10th, a 20th of the results later on, because as your brand builds authority, as your domain builds authority, as people want to work with you and link to you and all that, everything becomes exponentially easier. And early on in a company's development, they can't, it, it's hard to justify the time and resources on a channel that is harder and doesn't have a fast feedback loop. If you've ever listened to anything that you know, 
Y Combinator, y Combinator has to say, Justin Kahn has to say, like any people who really know their way around startups, what they say is you always have to be learning and iterating rapidly. SEO in general isn't a good channel for that. And even if it is, it's later on, but early on, it's a terrible channel for that. So, but at the same time to play devil's advocate, there's definitely companies that have done SEO earlier on and have seen results, but I think it's very situation dependent. Like if you, if you don't have a, if you don't have much budget, like if you don't have capital to pour into paid ads and like burn a bunch of money learning the hard way, then SEO can make sense. And if you have the time and you can find scrappy resources, then it can make sense. So, you know, all the things like the scrappy things to build your brand, AKA getting links and finding ways to do like really good content. But I think my middle ground there would be when earlier stage founders asked me about content, what I say is that I think about SEO in terms of foundation and growth and foundation is the very obvious stuff, you know, like whatever you are, like X, Y, Z software, if you're B2B and if that's competitive, whatever, then niche down until you get something so specific that it's not that competitive. And then content wise, what are the pieces of content that screw SEO? Don't think about it for a minute that you just want to have for, leads for prospects for people to visit your website and oftentimes that's the content that can actually either do well for seo now or later and if it does even if it doesn't do well for seo now that's okay because it's serving other purposes and then once you sort of validate your product you validate other channels then you can go to make a big investment in seo and not worry that if it doesn't get a return in one month that your board is going to want to get rid of you that's a great answer. And I like, I like both sides. And I, and I must say that it's, it's aligned also with the advice that we give to clients in uh, early stage companies that approach us uh, in many cases. Now, speaking of um, uh, you know, planning and strategy and how companies should think about all these things, in your website, you mentioned that you help companies build long-term revenue generating content assets. And I'm really curious, what you mean by that and if you could share some examples of such assets in companies you know in different uh, life cycle stages for sure yeah um so i think really i mean in a way to be honest that's kind of just you know a creative way to say anything that comes out of seo like because one distinction between seo and other channels is a lot of times other channels are you do something you get a return and then there's no real long term and when I'm educating founders and marketers on how to think about SEO, it's like, no, 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 just the results you get this month and the month after and the month after the thing is it's more, there's like a fixed cost for that content asset. And then it appreciates over time. And yes, you can, in, you know, invest in promotion for it and links and yes, you can update it and all that stuff. But unlike other channels, that value is going to appreciate over time. It's like uh, real estate un unless there's another crash and whatnot, but I, I won't explore that metaphor in too much detail. Um, so yeah, when it comes to that, that's just like language I use because I want people to think about it in terms of here's the return on you get on this over time. And then as you build more stuff, it all compounds. But another way I'd say, I mean, that is there's sort of, you know, regular landing pages, regular blog posts, and then there's sort of things kind of in between or a little bit different. So one company I've worked with for a while, Hotjar, if you, they, they do these things, we called them hubs. And I worked with their in-house content team on that who are fantastic. And the people I worked with before who aren't there anymore were also really fantastic. And we built these things that we called hubs. And like, if you go to hotjar.com slash heat maps, for example, it's, we kind of built a funnel around heat maps where, okay, there's like, you have questions about it. You want to see examples, you want to see tools and compare them. And we built a series of pages like that. And over time, that has done better and better and better. It got more cumulative content than all the content before. It converted better, it got better engagement and just, and then it attracted links better because it just, it wasn't anything revolutionary, but it just looks unique relative to, you know, whatever, another blog post. And so when I think about content assets, it can be anything that you do for SEO or sort of a, what I would call more of a special asset like that, that uh, and all of it should appreciate over time. Does it ever happen to you that a company comes to ask for your help, to ask to work with organic growth marketing, and you are like, 
yes, you are in the right stage. Yes, you can afford the service, but I can't really see how we can help you. And I will give you an example here. Let's say that Drift comes to you back in 2015 when they started, let's say, uh, evangelizing the term conversational marketing. Okay. Do you think that you could help such a company back then? And I'm, I'm asking, you know, I'm using Drift as an example. It could be Gong nowadays, for example, because they are using um, other terms such as revenue intelligence and so on. All I'm trying to ask is, are there cases where the category uh, or the feature or the product may be a bit more press, the, the way people search for that hasn't yet matured, and you're like, you know what, it's not going to happen through, through SEO. You have to use other channels like community building and so on and so forth. Mm, that's a really good question. So my answer, I think you're, 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 the basic premise of your question is would I work with them, right? So I think it depends how much risk they are willing to take, which with the example you threw out, I think it's fair to say that they are okay taking risks. And I haven't worked with them for the record, but uh, that's a really good example uh, because sometimes people do this thing where they invent a category or they're the first, one of the first iterators of it. But then they also say, well, because we're that, we don't want to talk about anything else. And then like that's surrounding it. So for example, if you're, if, if you want to, if you're in their position, you probably want to be relevant for email marketing and other things that people think about. So if you sort of go back to a basic SEO framework or what problem are people trying to solve? That's a better framework for thinking about SEO and keyword research than, oh, we're this, all we can ever do is create content on this. So I think it depends on their willingness to get creative and explore the kind of jobs to be done in problem frameworks. So you, if you look at, oh, they're trying to, people want to increase LTV, they want to increase retention, they want, they want alternatives to email marketing. All of those topics have a ton of green pasture ahead for SEO. Not as much now as it did back then, but you get the point. So what I usually do is I'm very upfront with any company and say, hey, here's what Here's the, what the search landscape looks like at a high level. The things that are obviously relevant to you. Sometimes there's a big ceiling and then it's a layup. There's no, there's nothing even to talk about. And other times it's like, well, I see a play to scale this channel, but here's the risk and here's the uncertainty. Here's my hypothesis around it. Do you want to do this? Yes or no. And then I'll give my, the, my honest opinion on how I would think about it in their shoes. You mentioned jobs to be done and... I'm, I'm curious whether or not the way you identify those jobs to be done, obviously you can use, you know, keyword research tools and so on and so forth to find what people are looking for, but do you feel, or is this something that you do um, with your clients that in order to find those jobs to be done, you have to get on customer interviews and ask the people, ask the people who pay for the service, the service themselves. For sure. And actually, just to really quickly tie this back to a previous question, I think a lot of the time when SEO doesn't work, again, whether it's with agencies or in-house, is when an SEO person has blinders. And your process is solely inclusive of identify a couple competitors and see what they're doing and copy it exactly. And sometimes that actually works okay because the competitors are really thorough, but then it means it's also going to be difficult. But that's something that like, I, I would be interested in expanding into in the future in terms of doing that. But I also, another filter that I use for companies is to kind of make our lives easier is people that already understand that they have a product marketing function. They built all this out and what they really need is someone to translate all of these, you know, customer personas, jobs to be done, yada, yada into what are the search opportunities that pertain to that and here's a prioritized list of it. And do you agree with our hypothesis about why this traffic will convert? So again, in terms of setting yourself for, up for success as whether you're an individual freelancer, in-house or agency, it's making sure that in B2B, you have either access to that or you're going to do it because otherwise it's probably not going to go well and you're going to come up with a bunch of generic things and people are going to start questioning you. That's a great answer. Um, I'd like to shift gears a bit. And I would like to discuss something that um, I'm very interested about. And I know, I can only assume that many of the companies that you're working with come to you because they want that strategic thinking and that um, thinking from someone who is outside of, you know, the day-to-day -day of running the business and so on and so forth. 
And strategy, in, at least as I understand, is, is a very general concept, okay? Um, I would like to, to hear your thoughts on how should a SaaS company approach uh, Conan and SEO strategy. And what should be the elements of that strategy? What a strategy should include in order to be complete? Got it. Yeah, this is actually a really good segue from the previous question because I think it's basically an, an expansion on that where I see, and this is one that I talk about with my team all the time is there's this, there's this kind of misconception that when you work with an SEO person, the SEO person should tell you what to do. I fundamentally believe that that is not the case, especially in B2B SaaS. I see our job as collecting and collating a bunch of inputs from them and then being like the client, the company that we're working with, and then doing our own research on top of that based on similar inputs and maybe different ones, and then putting it together. And what we do well, I think, is having a framework for how to think about what are all the different page types that you could have? What are all the different topics that you could write about? And then what is a framework to prioritize and then start launching these? And I think that right there is the thing that every company Small companies have a tough time with it because they have limited resources and then big companies tend to get into paralysis because they want to do a bunch of things and they're not sure what to pick. So uh, to answer your question about what are the inputs, I mean, the jobs to be done, personas are one, uh, even, and then just sort of looking at what are all of your products, again, like whatever customer data you can have, doing customer or doing research against that, looking at like how can we create competitor type content? And like we have a framework of a bunch of different th like check boxes that we go down. And then not just looking at what are competitors doing that are direct, but when we, when we look at all the areas that your product and use case and jobs to be done covers, how do we find companies that are doing that that we can use as a starting point? And how do we just do our own research? Like one thing I think is really underrated is using a tool like keywords everywhere. I'm not sure if you've used that. And then just starting with some like not SEO phrase, like, you know, I want to do blah, blah, blah. And then just seeing where it takes you. So you're like, Oh, look, I see this recommended search. Oh, that has volume. Click that. Oh, go there, go there, go there. And when you sort of combine all of these different things, it's not rocket science, but it's just about having the diligence to do all of it and then tie it up in a way that's digestible. So people can decide, Oh, I understand it. Here's why we would do these different things. And we give them input as to why, but ultimately they get to decide because it's their content and their brand. And all we can do is give them a framework for how to think about it. I get it. Yeah. And I, and I, and I strongly believe that the, the reason why a company should trust a partner uh, and work with a partner is because they essentially bring in the framework and the, the showing you the limits of what is possible and show you also the way that this can be achieved. You mentioned keywords everywhere. And, you know, regardless of the tool that, that someone may be using for keyword research or anything like that, I would like to ask, what's the starting point, though? You mentioned, like, I want to do this, which may indicate a specific use case, okay? A job to be done, let's say. But is this something that you get by getting on uh, calls with customers? Like, we are going to interview them and try to uh, slowly understand what's the job that they have to, to do here and then use that in order to translate that into topics that we can cover um, for organic search and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, ultimately, as search marketers, what we're trying to do is reverse engineer what customers might do to land on us. And it can also be reverse engineering where we're actually trying to kind of inspire this behavior in the first place because you might not even see other companies that are doing this but thinking about here's all these different customers and what kind of problems do they have and how do they go about doing that so i'd see there's sort of customer research as far as understanding people's problems and then within that as a subset of that you can even ask them what are the things you searched and a really interesting example of this from my time at big commerce that i just thought of is we, the, the whole team at the time, as it happens at enterprise companies, we got this idea in our head of what we are as an enterprise e-commerce platform. And that's what people are searching. So the sort of executive attention on that term was just off the charts. Like people cared about this page. It didn't get that much traffic. And then one of our product marketers 
went to some sort of event, I don't remember what, and he asked people what they would search. And every single person said some version of online store, which is hilarious because that's like in sort of big commerce company world, that's like, oh, only a small business would search that. But it turns out, no, 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 that's an assumption. And it kind of, and, and that's guided a lot of my thinking around when companies just toss around terms like our customers this and our customers that, and they don't do that. To be honest, like, unless it's a really well-informed, well-cited data point, like, I typically don't believe them. And I tend to believe that that's more of sort of, you know, company gospel where internal marketers sort of come up with this idea of how sophisticated people are and they use all this different language, which could be the case. But in reality, it might be something else, which, so this wasn't a direct answer to your question, but it was somewhat related. That was a great example, by the way. That was a great, great example on, on why, as I understand at least, on why you shouldn't make assumptions and you should go on and talk to the people who are actually searching for, for you know, a product, a solution like yours. I have a question here that I'd like to ask since we touched on prioritization a bit. Let's say that you have the strategy in place and you have put everything together for a new client that you're working uh, with. And I guess that their question would be, after they see all the deliverables, would be, okay, now what? And I would like to hear your thoughts on prioritization. How do you, you know, guide uh, the companies that you're working with after doing the research and so on? Is it that we are going to do those pages first, those compares, com comparison pages or alternative pages first because there is intent there? Or we are going to do... Uh, those pages with informational search intent because they will help us um, build topical authority and protect our rankings for a specific page. I would like to hear how you, you know, think about prioritization nowadays. Got it. Yeah. So I think it's, um, it, it's really difficult. That's first of all. And I think ultimately you want the output to be simplified to where people don't make too complex choices. But the truth is there's a lot of inputs that go into this. So there's even just to start with, there's the, there's the action type. Are we creating new content or updating old content? Those are different levels of effort. Then there's what type of page are we working with for, if you already have a template, like a landing page or a blog post, that's typically easy. It's like, typically people don't really care that much about blogs. Lots of people have opinions about landing pages, but a, a company's blog can get like 300 X the traffic and you could put anything up on there and no one would really care. My point is there not that you should do that, but that it's easy. And then another dimension is topic. So what are different topics and what, uh, what do they correspond to? And then lastly is like the sort of the hypothesis of how difficult it will be to rank, which is really, it's tough, but a very simple way to look at it is how related is this to things that we already rank for, including branded search. So your brand plus thin, that can help you rank. So between all those, what I tried to do is say, here are a bunch of different avenues. We can create these type of pages along these topics, and here's why. And for example, this might be, this is the stuff that's tied to our core product, and we know it can rank easier. And then there's more of the, okay, these, there's often this category where it's a new category, it has a big potential, we don't have any data to tell us how it'll convert, so it's a bit of a speculative bet. And then you have the really easy stuff, which is either the comparison competitive pages or just sort of optimizing old content. And between those, I like to make a diversified set of bets. So in one track of work, we'll work on updating content. And with some companies that are decently known, we've like doubled their traffic within a couple months just because they had a big backlog or the, like existing content and they hadn't had much, much of an SEO strategy. So we can plow through optimizing a bunch of pages and see a lift. Then in tandem, we'll start to tee up some content that we have decently high confidence in, even if the ceiling isn't that high. And then in the third track, there's maybe, you know, the more your more speculative bets where we don't, we don't know how long it'll take us to rank for this stuff. We don't know how it'll convert. And maybe even sometimes the third party traffic data is so like, I, I just don't have confidence in it because it's kind of new. So if I went all in on either on any one of those, I'd either have a low ceiling, a long time horizon or more uncertainty. So what I prefer to do is do some certain things up front to get everybody excited about the program, but then also start building the groundwork for some of the bigger bets that if you don't do that, then in two years, people will say, what happened to this program, Nigel? I thought we were going to get a bunch of traffic and revenue. 
that's the thing that uh, it's it's extremely important to to get that initial buy-in so that you can uh, as as you mentioned uh, take bigger bets uh, that will have uh, bigger rewards uh, more likely uh, but if you don't have this initial buy-in uh, from the company inside the company it, most likely it's not going to happen they, they will not uh, give you the green light to test more interesting things. Now, the last question that I have for you is, where do you see all these things, you know, uh, where is Cond SEO for SaaS companies going? Uh, is it going to be just competitor pages and alternative pages and some use case pages and blog posts? Uh, are we going to see anything new? Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on the future. Got it. Yeah. So this is where I go from the, the up, up until this point, it's been a lot about a lot of tangible things and more knowns and things I have higher confidence in. And now it gets a bit more speculative, speculative. But one thing I've been believing more and more is that if you go back a few years, whenever it was that Brian Dean wrote that post about skyscraper, right? And I'm sure people have come to you and said, Hey, can we get a skyscraper for something? And now everybody does it. And now the whole, like everything in the SaaS space is filled up with these just monstrosities of like big guides. And to be honest, like I've, I've contributed to this. So I have like, I, I can't even knock it too much. Uh, right. Yeah. Er everyone has. <laughs> um, and we do the, it's, there's this weird dissonance that marketers do where they separate the way that they know they behave as humans, as searchers, as customers, as whatever, relative to the work that they do. And I think like I have a decent attention span overall, but for a regular human being in almost 2022, it means like I have no attention span. I'm, I'm going in and out of searches all day. I barely read anything. I'm like a content marketer in a way. And I still have a hard time sitting there and reading everything. I've looked at, you know, hot jar data with heat maps and videos. And a lot of people read stuff, but a lot of it is the most like just up and down and all over the place. And anyway, what that leads me to is, I'm seeing more and more signs from Google that they don't need to see everything on a page for it to do well. So the, the current thinking right now is if you want to be an expert on whatever the topic is, you need to bludgeon your audience to death with every, the history of what is this, how to do it, best practices, blah, blah, blah. And one thing I saw with the with looking at the way people interacted with that hot jar content I mentioned is when we had shorter pages that were divided up, people were able to navigate and go directly to what they wanted. And I, so I think that'll get more popular. And then the next step of that is Google is going to get better at not even needing to have all, all the relevant terms and everything written down on a page. So between interactive content where you sort of, it's not that the traditional thing where you say, Hey, this page needs to get a clear scope score of whatever, and everything needs to be on it. It's going to be a lot more about depth and alternative formats like video. I've seen interesting things, even from I've taken inspiration from places like the New York Times where they have content that you click through and it's multiple choice. Ultimately, when you look at the way people interact with all media, they like TikTok, Instagram has their whatever product, YouTube has their whatever product. It's all about all these quick hits and letting people opt in and opt in and make choices. So why is it that our search strategies are assuming that people want to read novels every day as they research basic things? Like it doesn't add up. And the reason we do it is because it's what works. And I'm starting to see more and more signs. And whenever I see them, I share them with my team and close friends in the industry of content that's ranking. It totally defies all the other content. It is either, you know, sort of a slideshow clicking through, maybe it's a video Maybe it's other stuff and like everything in SEO, Google tests things and then more and more. And then when some things start working, more people do it and then the floodgates will open and everyone will start to do it. So I think in, I don't know how many years, like maybe three, four or five, we're going to look back and say, whoa, like now we're creating content. The content we're creating is similar to these other channels. And we're going to say, wow, do you remember the time when we used to tell, we used to pay writers a bunch of money to write 10,000 word articles lol that was kind of ridiculous wasn't it so anyway that's my sort of big hypothesis for the future i like that and i i would say that it's very close to my own personal feelings and uh, observations from from organic search that if i could you know give it a, a name user experience and what people feel when they visit the website 
and interact with, with that website, this will play a key role uh, moving forward. And I think that this is a great things to, th way to, to wrap things up. Uh, Nigel, uh, where can people find more about you, uh, get in touch, and more about organic growth marketing? Yes, uh, so I guess just basically check out the website and we have a forum or find me on LinkedIn and shoot me a DM. That's probably the, the best way for, for a marketer. I'm not very, uh, I don't spend a lot of time on social media, I'll admit, but if you hit me up on LinkedIn, then I'll get back to you. That's great. Nigel, thank you very much for being with us. So yeah, this was fun. Thanks for having me, George.